We will now move on to trying to understand the logic inside of the vulnerable loop in order to get some sort of right primitive before we can think of ways to escalate privileges. And so basically the idea here is we know our recovery thread is stuck inside this loop and we saw we were already able to leak some kernel pointers from the k-mutant structure, more specifically a key thread address and a k-resource manager address. So we know that, okay, there is some interesting stuff that the kernel is going to be doing with our user land structures inside of some of the more complicated functions that get called by this while loop, because we already confirmed some of these functions were writing a pointer to the k resource manager as well as a pointer to the k thread while accessing our fake userland k enlistments. And so basically, you can just boil down the good candidates for finding something like a write primitive by just identifying all of the kernel functions that are called that directly reference your userland enlistments or reference some other fields pulled out of that enlistments, like the mutex. And at first, you might be lucky. There might be some publicly known techniques in papers about how to abuse one of these kernel functions being called. And actually, in this case, there was insofar as like abusing the op the reference object API used to be a fairly standard way of getting a write primitive, but we will see it's been mitigated in newer version of Windows 10, so we can't really use that anymore. So we are going to go over all the different functions that are being called in order to see which one we can abuse to get an actual write primitive to an arbitrary kernel address. And so once we've done that, we'll see that actually one of them allows us to get a write zero primitive to an arbitrary address we control and we'll investigate how we can abuse a specific field called previous mode that when it's set to zero it gives us like a really good primitive and once we have that previous mode set to zero we'll investigate uh, how we can abuse this arbitrary read write primitive to actually elevate our own privilege by modifying the actual token of our process. Okay, let's get started. So the first function we can go into is called ob reference object. So let's dive into it. The ob reference object is called on our userland kernismant passed as the object argument. It is very straightforward and doesn't provide a lot of opportunity for abuse. Our fake userland kernismant is indeed prefixed with a fake object header in userland. So it is a candidate, but there is not a hole we can use it for. I guess one other quirk of targeting ob reference object in general is that there is an unavoidable call to ob de reference object later in the vulnerable function. So we wouldn't have to compensate whatever we do with some additional complexity to ensure it is safe for the later call. So the next function we can analyze is ke wait for single object. And as we saw earlier, this function is passed the k enlistment mutex, which is a k mutant structure inside our fake user and k enlistment. So we actually control the k mutant content as well. The ke wait for single object function is fairly complicated, so it has some interesting potential. Similarly, I guess the, there is an important caveat to remember, which is that later in the function, before we make the recovery thread exit the loop, we must also have this same mutex passed through ke release mutex, which expects the mutex to be a valid enough k mutant. And so, yeah, we decided to look at something else. That being said, it's actually a very interesting function. And so maybe we missed something and there is some kind of write primitive in there. So we are going to skip uh, the ke release mutex call for now and just focus on the following function, which is TMP set notification resource manager. This function was the first one we thought we would use. But again, it didn't pan out. The idea was that it is past the k resource manager structure and our fake 
userland can instance that we control, there is one piece of code in this function that looks especially promising and we originally thought we could make use of it. So in this code snippet below, we see that the p final, final notification packet is retrieved from the k enlistment final notification. So we could craft a completely controlled p final notification packet fake structure in New Zealand. And so we can see that this pointer would be non null. And so we would go to b skip allocation. And so in the following code, we can see that the allocation would be skipped because it would jump directly to this b skip allocation label. And at least one fully controlled key value is written to a pointer we control, which could be useful because it would give us the right primitive potentially. However, if we rewind and check some prerequisite to reach this code, there is one big problem. Basically, the only way for the k final notification to be used is that notification mask has one of some specific flags set. But the problem is before calling that notification function from the vulnerable function, the flags are set to different flags. So we can't really reach that code, it seems. So the next function we can analyze is called ob the reference object. Let's dive into it. And so I mentioned that in the past it was used for exploitation purposes. And so the first thing is it is being passed our fake userland k enlistment as the object, and we control a fake object header in New Zealand, prefixing that k enlistment. And so in the past, for instance, on Windows 7, you could provide a, a type index of zero, and then you would actually make it use a function pointer called security procedure that we could control from New Zealand. It wouldn't give us like a right primitive, but it would actually allow us to execute code potentially. But we can't do it anymore anyway, because of a mitigation introduced in Windows 10 called object type index field encoding. And the fact that we can't jump from the kernel back to userland to execute code anyway, due to another mitigation called SMEP. So it would actually mean allocating code in the kernel with read, write, execute, execute permissions, which is also th something that is really hard nowadays due to other mitigations. So going back to the one we skipped previously, which is KE release mutex. And so similarly to the KE wait for single object that we saw previously, um, the KE release mutex function is passed a K mutant object that is part of the K enlistment. So we control it. You can imagine that this KE release mutex could potentially be interesting just in so far as if you recall from the memory address revelation that we found with KE wait for single object, what was happening is that inside KE wait for single object, it was inserting structures onto a linked list into userland. And so immediately that tells you, well, when we are actually acquiring the mutex, it's inserting structures into a linked list. Then when we are releasing a mutex, probably it's going to be a linking structures, which traditionally would have immediately been, you know, a point of interest because you could potentially get like a right primitive out of something like an, a link from a linked list. So basically what we can do is start setting up things in New Zealand so that we can enter this function and start probing around different code paths. And basically KE release mutex is just a wrapper around KE release mutant. And we control the K mutants, like I said, since it's part of the userland K enlistment we control. And then the KE release mutant functions is pretty big. It's about 300 lines of C and calls a lot of different functions. And some of the code paths that are taken depend on the type of actual objects and fields value. And so the procedure here is just a lot of trial and error, stepping through, adjusting flags, seeing where we could go and only analyzing 
and really reversing the code path that seem of specific interest to us. And so we're going to detail a few interesting paths and more specifically a function being called, which is ki try unweight thread. And so before we analyze the ki try unweight thread function being called, um, I guess one of the examples is originally we were looking at Windows 7 when we were reversing a lot of this. And what we see in yellow below is there is the unlinking that occurs for the mutant on some linked list and it's done without safe unlinking. So it's not validating that this blink and fling pointers points to other entries on the linked list that point back to this specific mutant that it is being operated on. So originally, we actually just planned to use that as a write primitive. And then we realized, oh, right, this was mitigated on Windows 8. So we needed to find something else to have our exploit work on Windows 10, 1809. But digging like that in this part of the code was still useful because it also showed that we still needed valid pointers to avoid crashing during the unlink operation. And so, yeah, we could craft fake memory in New Zealand to pass that code. And so, because again, we control everything in this K-mutant structure, we control this field called weight list head. And so in this code, we control weight list head here. So we control the weight list head entry variable, and then we control the current weight block variable, which is going to be used inside that uh, do while loop. And I guess, I guess a good example of what this code is doing is when the vulnerable thread is spinning, trying to get access to this uh, K resource manager mutex to actually release it. If it fails to get the mutex right away, it gets added to the wait list of that mutex. So it's, it's a separate link list of things waiting for the mutex. And the logic is that once whatever is holding the mutex unlocks it, the kernel can try to sort of optimistically find some other thread that was waiting for that mutex to become available and immediately try to schedule it because it's just more efficient to have things that have been blocked to start running as soon as possible. And so basically what we can do is fake a K weight block structure pointed by our K mutant fake username mutex and then trigger code that will process that K weight block pointer. And so basically we can pretend that there is some waiting entry on the wait list and we see that it ends up calling ki try unwait thread in one of the two paths and the current wait block we control is passed to this function. And so we are going to see that this is the function that will try to opportunistically schedule the thread that is going to all of a sudden be able to use this mutex, which is fake and controllable by us in this case. And so we follow inside of this ki try unwait thread function. And basically it first looks up the k thread structure associated with the thread that is waiting for this mutex to become available. And again, we control this weight block so we can provide an arbitrary case thread structure and have the kernel operate on it. And so the first thing of interest is that there is code that tries to lock a field called the thread lock field inside of this case thread that we are providing the pointer. And so really what this means is that it's checking to see if a certain bit of the lock is zero. And if it is zero, it's going to set this particular bit to one. And so that's basically a spin lock. And because we can provide this case thread pointer, we can basically have this operation done on an arbitrary address in the kernel and potentially set some bit value in the kernel to one that used to be zero. And so that might be interesting. 
And so there is some other logic, like assuming that the previous straight lock value bit is set to one eventually, it's going to basically end this do while loop. And so depending how we do it, we might control this state field and we could make sure that the thread isn't suspended. So we actually skip this if condition. So if we provided an address in New Zealand for the owner thread, then we definitely control the state field because it's in New Zealand memory. So we can set it to anything we want. But if we are trying to provide a pointer in the kernel and setting some bits to one using the previous spin lock, we would have to make sure that wherever the state member happens to be in that kernel memory, which is relative to the kernel memory address that we're trying to set the bit one in, we need to make sure it will have the state field such that the value is not suspended. So we skip that part of the code. And so at the very end, what happens is it sets the entire thread lock 64 bit value to zero. And so again, assuming you, you can meet the earlier prerequisite where you set the one bit value to one and then the thread state wasn't suspended, what you end up doing is you set the entire thread lock keyword to zero. So you're setting 64 bits to zero, whereas originally you were setting one bit to one which was the index zero out of the 64 bits. And so this is potentially interesting. So or originally we didn't know about uh, this trick that you can use, which I'm, ag I'm about to explain. We saw this logic in this function and we thought that the ability to write zero somewhere was too limited. We thought it would be more powerful and useful to have like a robust read write primitive that lets us do whatever we want. And we didn't know that just writing the value of zero to somewhere in the Windows kernel would allow us to actually elevate privileges. But eventually, after we wrote our entire exploit and stuff, we found a presentation from Kaspersky that mentioned how the zero day exploit exploited this exact same bug. And they used a different trick than us. And it's what we're going to explain now because it's easier to understand and it's significantly more powerful than what we used. And so if you can use it, it's better. We did find some scenarios where you can't use that trick. And so we'll, we'll still explain the other method we came up uh, with later. But basically there is this concept in the Windows kernel, which is called uh, previous mode. And it's basically a flag inside of the e thread structure, which says what the last mode of the thread was at the time that the system call was called. And so the idea is that if you trap from user mode using an actual syscall instruction, the kernel should set the, the, this flag that says you came from user mode by setting previous mode to one. However, if you came from kernel mode, previous mode would be set to zero by the kernel. And what that does is that certain syscall will do a bunch of security checks if it came from user mode, whereas these checks would be skipped if the function call happened from kernel mode. So for instance, there is this NT write virtual memory function. And if the previous mode was set to one, indicating that the, the call was made from user mode, the code will do a whole bunch of validation to make sure that these addresses that you're passing to the system call actually point into user land and that you are not trying to write some address in the kernel. But on the flip side, if you are familiar with uh, Windows internals, you might already know by now that there is a second version of this NT write virtual memory function. And so basically the other version is for the kernel side and it allows kernel drivers and other things in the kernel to call the same functionality. And it has the ZW prefix instead of the NT prefix. So in this case, the other API is called ZW write virtual memory, 
And so if you call the syscall from the kernel and you call the ZW version, it sets the previous mode to the value zero, which indicates kernel mode. And so if you then enter this empty write virtual memory function, the security check for validating whether or not addresses are, are in user land or not will be skipped. And so we showed in the previous slide that we have the ability to set a 64-bit value to zero as long as the least significant bit is zero to begin with. And we can set it to one in order to lock the spin lock portion of the code. Eventually, the full 64-bit value will be changed to zero. And so it turns out that the way the kernel code checks if kernel APIs are called from kernel mode is reflected by the previous mode set to zero. But yeah, we see in the part highlighted in, in yellow that it's calling ke get current thread. And basically what that is doing is it's looking up the current e-thread structure that called this system call. And then we see the bunch of checks done on the arguments if the call was made from user mode. And so if we recall the address revelation leaks that we have thanks to triggering the KTM bug, not only were we able to leak the address of the K resource manager, which lets us escape the loop, but the other address that was leaked to us was our own e thread structure. And so we actually know the address in the kernel that will hold the previous mode field of the e thread structure of our own recovery thread, which allows us to know the address of the thing we can override potentially. And so what that means is that when targeting the ki try unwait thread function, where we have a, a write zero primitive, we can basically compute an address in the kernel such that the honor thread field that is assigned at the very beginning based of the k weight block that we control, we make sure that the honest thread field is overlaid on top of our e thread structure in a way that one of the values adjacent to previous mode we know can be zero, which allows us to log the little spin lock and one of the other values in the e thread that overlaps with the state we know won't be the value suspended, which ends up being quite easy to do. And we do it in such a way that when the 64-bit thread lock is set to zero, it overlaps with the previous mode value in the e thread. And this basically just lets us override this previous mode with the value zero. So you have to be a little bit careful in that some of the fields adjacent to the previous mode do get used. And so you have to make sure that you find one where the value will always be zero so that you can enter the spin lock. Because if the value happens to get used occasionally and it's set to one and you have no way to control it and it's not going to get set back to zero, you can basically end up causing the kernel to enter an infinite loop trying to lock the spin lock. Interestingly, the abuse of a previous mode set to zero, allowing arbitrary read-write in the kernel, was first documented in 2011 by Tarje Mant. But it's one of the, those things where you forget because you never used it or you've never seen an exploit using this before publicly. So I feel like whoever wrote the in the wild exploit either happened to reread the paper or have just been sitting on this technique themselves for a really long time. And then from this point onward, due to what is actually a, a featured bug in the Windows kernel, it will forever going forward think that our thread always came from kernel mode. And it's a bug because technically, according to Microsoft's own documentation, and based off the way it works on 32 bits, it should be restoring the previous mode value every time it exits the system call and goes back to user mode, but it doesn't actually do it on 64 bit. It only will do this kind of restoration if it's coming from the kernel originally. So in our case, basically we can just permanently say our thread is a kernel thread, and then we can call syscalls like nt write virtual memory from userland 
and give it a kernel address, then it lets us write whatever we want to any kernel address. And similarly, we can call the nt-read virtual memory function from userland, and this is called has the exact same security check, which we can just now bypass too. And so just by writing a zero value to our current e -thread previous mode once, we build a fully powerful arbitrary read-write primitive. And so I guess it's worth noting that I mentioned that there is a featured bug, which is that once you set previous mode to zero, it never gets unset and it makes it easier to exploit. But if Windows had fixed that problem, technically you could still abuse the previous mode functionality. It would just be a lot more complicated. Basically what you would have to do is have one thread that has this write zero primitive constantly writing zero to the previous mode of your recovery thread and have another thread constantly trying to use NT write virtual memory. And so you almost have like a second race condition where you're triggering your write zero primitive and you are racing some other privilege check and eventually you would pass it. But it, it would be significantly more annoying because the race window would be a lot harder to win. So basically, what does this write zero look like? We have to set up a little bit of extra fake structures and fields in New Zealand. Inside our fake k -nismant, we have the k mutant, which is inline in the k -nismant. And inside that k mutant, there is an inline dispatch header structure that contains a wait, wait list head pointer. And so we can fake the wait list head pointer to point to a k wait block entry in New Zealand as well, which then has a thread pointer that holds an address relative to our k thread previous mode we want to set to zero. But actually the state that we need to create is fairly simple, especially compared to an alternative method to using previous mode, which consists of an incrementing primitive, which we'll talk about later in the course. So after we implemented our own exploit that used that complicated write primitive, and then suddenly we found out about this previous mode trick, we're quite excited because it's really cool. So basically what this means is just going from a simple leak from the K resource manager and K thread. Using the K resource manager address we leaked, we already know we can exit the loop since we can use the K resource manager and Nisman head address. And now using the K thread address we leaked, we know the target address to write a value of zero to since we can use our case thread previous mode address. And writing the value of zero gives us an arbitrary read-write primitive. And then from there, we can access anything we want inside of the kernel using the nt-read virtual memory for reads and nt-write virtual memory for write in the kernel. And so the then the natural question is, well, what do you access now? The thing is, we don't know where kernel code addresses uh, or anything like that, but we know where our case thread is, which we just targeted for previous mode. So we can start reading all the pointers and structures initially referenced from our, our case thread using NT read virtual memory. We can link the full case thread structure out of kernel and the case thread structure has a pointer to the e-process structure because it tracks all of its own threads. And the e-process structure has a linked list of all of the processes running on the system. And so we know that there is a, a system process which has a PID number four, which is a stat static PID. So we can read out all of the e-process structures using the NT read virtual memory function and find this process with PID four. And then from its e-process structure, we can find the X fast ref pointer that it uses, which points to a token. And basically the idea is we know that the system processes token is the most powerful token on the system. And so we can record that pointer value. And finally, we can use NT write virtual memory to update our own 
case threads token to point to the same token, which basically turns our exploit into a anti-authority system process. The only other thing you have to keep in mind is to actually bump the reference count of the token object because it is managed by the object manager, which means that if you didn't do something like bumping the reference count and then you exited your exploit, when you exit, part of the destruction process of taking down your process is lowering down the reference count of all the referenced object. And one of them will be the system token pointer. So if you exploited the bug over and over and over again, and you didn't bump the reference count, what would end up happening is that it would try to eventually free the token object because every time you destroy the process, the kernel lowers the reference count. And once the reference count hits zero, the kernel will free the token object. But the system process is still using that token. So it would crash when the system would try to access that system token legitimately through the system e process. One last thing worth mentioning is in theory, you would be able to use this read write primitive to bypass something like CFG, like control flow guard, and get code execution in Windows 10, 18 or 9. But in our case, we don't need to and it's actually outside of the scope of this course.